Today's episode was a dream come true. I had the opportunity of spending an hour with one of my favorite authors and spiritual mentors, Gary Zukov. Gary wrote Seat of the Soul, a book I read for the first time in my 20s, and the book changed my life. It opened me up to understand how our souls work and has helped me live a life through purpose and loving intention. Gary Zukoff is a graduate of Harvard with a degree in international relations. He worked as a former U.S. Army Special Forces officer with Vietnam service and is a grandfather. The Seat of the Soul was first published in 1989, a number one New York Times bestseller. It's been translated into 30 languages and has been read by millions of people around the world. Gary says, there is an enormously huge, unprecedented transformation happening to human consciousness itself. This transformation is happening with amazing velocity within the last three generations, as opposed to 300,000 years that our five sensory perception evolved in. In other words, we are expanding. We are growing and we are learning to live more through love, by living more heart-centered, and with our soul's purpose at the forefront. Speaking with Gary is medicine for the soul. He is wise and gentle and resonates with joy. I hope you take time to listen and soak in the gold within the messages Gary is gifting us with today. Enjoy. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this incredibly special episode of Let's Talk Love. The The name of our podcast is Let's Talk Love, and we are going to be having this incredible hour with a man named Gary Zukoff. Gary, I have looked up to you for decades, <laughs> ever since I read your book, Seed of the Soul, and it is, is my one of my Bibles when it comes to spirituality and love and understanding our soul. I've, I've dog-eared so many pages in this book over the years, and um, I tried to remove this two for $20 sticker, but you know what? It's so it's such an old book that it, you can't, can't do it, but that's okay because it just shows that <laughs> I bought this at a bookstore many years ago, and it's been loved and um, treasured. So Gary, thank you. Thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, well, you're welcome, Robin. It's really good to be on your podcast. Thank you. So you wrote this book, Seat of the Soul in 1989, right? It was published in 1989. It was written uh, in November. It was finished in November 87. 87. So can you tell us, and this book has been read by millions and millions of people across the world. And I know it was written a while ago now, but what inspired you to, to write the book? Because you know, what, you know what I was interested by before you answer that question is the foreword that Oprah wrote and or and you said as well gary you said that you have read this book of course more times since you since you read since you wrote it you've read it and it's like you're you're learning something new every time you read it did you, do you feel like you, you channeled this book like is that no. no 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 i'm not a channel um but it's a co-creation yeah it's not possible to create alone because it's not right. possible to be alone. Yeah. And this is part of our new consciousness. We're becoming aware of this and a lot more. So everything that is created is a co-creation. And this book is no exception. Mm -hmm. but am I a channel? No. Do I, by, and by that I mean, I don't close my eyes and sit in front of a keyboard and when I open my eyes, there's a book or a chapter. It doesn't work that way. If you've ever hmm, had the feeling of creating something, maybe maybe a podcast, Robin, maybe uh, when, when you're hmm, in the zone and everything's going just right and it feels just right, that's a co-creation. Of course, you're co-creating with the person you're interviewing. But when it all falls together and the energy feels just right, then there's a larger co-creation happening. And that's co-creation with the universe. That's always happening. But what 
varies is our awareness of it. Right. So things have changed and you talk, we're going to talk about this as well during our conversation on how from the time that you wrote the book and the decades now that have followed, our consciousness has grown and, and has changed. So there's this greater, greater awareness of the, the collective awareness of, of our spirits, of our souls, living more from that place. But this is really what this book is about, right? Is about merging our personalities with our souls, living yes, more is. from our soul. Yes, exactly. And it's, and, and by the way, uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask our viewers not to take anything that I say as so, simply because I say it. But instead, if you resonate with anything that I say, then um, experiment with that. Apply it in your life. And if you like what it creates, experiment some more. Experiment with your life. That's what you have it for. And I also suggest that you don't take as so anything that anybody says just because they say it, even if they have written a book or they have a congregation or they have a television show. Try it out for yourself because you're the one that's creating the, con the experiences in your life. And what this book about is about, The Seed of the Soul, is learning how to create uh, the experiences or the consequences that you want to experience consciously. Yes. So can you please explain to us what the difference between our soul and our personality is? Your soul is that part of you that existed before you were born and will continue to exist after you die. It's that part of your personality that is immortal. It's not part of your personality. In fact, your personality for a while is a part of it, your soul. The seat of the soul is about everything you've talked to me about, but it's also and even more about a transformation in consciousness mm -hmm. in the human species. Not in you and in, and in me, but the, in the entire human species. And this has never happened before. And something else that's never happened before is an evolution in human consciousness that's happening this fast. It's happening within three human generations. Now, to compare that, our old consciousness, the consciousness that's now dying, evolved over 300,000 years, 300 millennia. So when I speak to you now about a consciousness that is appearing in the entire human species in three generations, that's faster than an eye blink from the perspective of evolutionary time as we've known it. It's faster than a heartbeat, and it's happening, and you can see it for yourself. And that is perhaps some of the things that we'll talk about. The old consciousness <clears throat> was limited to the five senses. In other words, five sensory humans, like I was born, or that's all I thought about for quite a while. Um, for these individuals, if something can't be seen, or tasted, or touched, or heard, or smelled, it doesn't exist. It's not considered reality. And the old consciousness, which we can call five sensory consciousness, um, the understanding of power, the only understanding of power that an individual that's limited to the five senses can have is power as the ability to manipulate and to control. So that's external power. That's trying to change the world. The new consciousness is very different from that. It is an explosion of our awareness beyond the limitations of the five senses. For example, 
Have you ever, and I'm speaking now to everyone who's listening to us, have you ever had the thought, I'm more than my body and my mind. I know I am. That is a multi-sensory experience. We call the new consciousness multi-sensory. Because of this, the five senses together form a single sensory system, and its object of detection is physical reality. Multi-sensory perception obliterates that. It takes us far beyond that. Um, if you've ever thought to yourself, I don't think that the world around me is random or even entirely random. It's just not random. There's something more in it. There's meaning in it. There's substance. There's something I can learn about myself, not the world, but about myself from the world. That is a multi-sensory question. Yes. Uh, a five-sensory human would consider this Nonsense. Isn't that interesting? Literally not sensical. No five yeah. sensory understanding can reach this. A five sensory individual cannot relate to what I'm describing now because there's nothing in his or her experience that can connect with it to make it real. There's more five cent five sensory individuals in the world now than there are multi-sensory because multi-sensory perception is emerging. And within the, in the next two generations, everyone will be multi-sensory. Really? Really. And you can begin to see it happen now and how fast it's happening. It's happening in three human generations and one of them has already arrived and two more are coming. Now for a lot of our listeners, they may not even know that there was such a thing as five century perception in which nothing that cannot be detected by the five senses is considered real. The soul is such a thing. The soul to a five century human is something that maybe uh, you learned about in Sunday school, or at most it's a uh, part of uh, theology, maybe yeah. philosophy, but for multi-sensory humans, it's real. It's more than a, uh, something in your chest cavity. It is the essence of who you are. It is your being. You yeah. are a part, an incarnation of one part of your soul. And that is what you are right now, the you that's listening to Robin and to me. That means it's the you that has a birthday and a death day. So there are hundreds of millions of individuals who are acquiring multi-sensory perception. And there are millions and millions who are born with it. <coughs> Neonates now are, for the most part, born with multi-sensory perception. So there's something else that is important for me to share with you. And that is that multi-sensory perception or the new consciousness comes with a new understanding of power and a new potential of power. And that is the alignment of your personality with your soul. And there's even more than that. The old understanding of power, external power, the ability to manipulate and control is now poison. It's toxic. It produces only violence and destruction. And you can try this out for yourself. You have been trying it out for yourself in a lot of ways. This applies to everyone. But now as you become aware of it, you can begin to experiment with it. The new power authentic power, real power, is the alignment of your personality with your soul. Your soul's intentions are harmony and cooperation and sharing and reverence for life. And as you align yourself, your personality 
with the intentions of your soul, align your personality with your soul, you create power. That's the new understanding of power. And it's not a given in your life now. Multisensory perception is a given. It's a gift from the universe. We don't have to develop it, although we will strengthen it. But authentic power needs to be created by you. And that is what the seat of the soul is about. It's about the epic transformation of consciousness that is transforming the entire human species at the same time. Now, there are things in the new consciousness that are familiar, like reincarnation, like karma. But there aren't many five sensory individuals for whom that's real, who really act that way. But as we become multi-sensory, it is real. And we start to enable ourselves to act on those things because it's important to us because when we act we are creating consequences for ourselves and if we're not aware of the intention that we're holding that intention is unconscious and that intention will create painful consequences right. so that's it for a beginning to talk about this book the seat of the soul yeah. and to talk about our lives now. So Gary, can you please explain to us? I, I, I've been drawn, I've, I've been drawn to spiritual works um, and understanding our souls since I was 17 and here I am 46. So that's 30, 30 years of reading and trying to and like working to understand and apply these principles and live through my soul and my spirit for a lot of my life. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I think there's a lot of people, I know there is that around me that we all have the same questions. It's like, yes, I want to, and your, your book is so great for giving us those tools to live through intention, make conscious choice, think about the ramifications of our choices, right? Before, or like you talk about temptation, like that's like a little teaser. This is what could happen if you make that choice. You haven't done anything yet, but you're being tempted and you, so that you can see the future of the possible um, ramification of that choice you might make. <laughs> so, that's exactly the case. so this is living through awareness. But I think there's also a lot of misunderstanding as well. Even though, you know, we're doing our best here to, to live consciously and through and build an authentic power you know but you say in the book for instance we misunderstand karma like can you can you please explain to us karma is a little bit complicated right <laughs> but can you please explain to us what karma is because i think we do misunderstand it's not just it's not maybe not all, all in this lifetime this human experience that i may be having experiences that could have possibly been from my past life in a different body, right? Yes, it could have been. This, again, is something the five sensory humans can't relate to. For them, yeah. this is all that is. You only come, you, you're only here once, so go for the gusto. <laughs> if you do that without awareness, the gusto is going to bring you some painful experiences. Mm. If you do it with awareness, from the heart, with love, the gusto is going to bring you some wonderful experiences and add those to the experiences that you have already created for yourself that you have not yet stepped into or that not yet found you. So you ask, what is karma? Karma is not that complex, Robin. Uh, Robin. It's, it's simple. It's a messenger. It's a message delivery system. Look at it that way. When you act in an interaction with someone else, you create experiences in that person. And those experiences you yourself will encounter. Mm. Uh, karma, uh, you might look at it, uh, whatever experience you create in someone else when you act comes back to you like a laser-guided boomerang. And it comes straight 
to you. And it always will. But you don't know, you don't know when, but you know it will come. So that makes it worthwhile to begin to become aware of what you may be causing others to experience. This doesn't mean you're responsible for what else someone else experiences. It means you're responsible for the intention you hold when you interact with them. Now, what is an intention? What would you say an intention is? I would say an intention is how I want to use my power either for love or if I'm using, um, if, how I'm wanting to, to direct my power exactly. through choice. That's, that's it. And you can become even more precise. An intention is your reason for doing something. It's your motivation. Mm -hmm. You can put it this way. An intention is a quality of consciousness. Mm -hmm. that infuses your word or your actions when you hold it. Now, you've, put, you've identified it exactly in the earth school, which is where we are. And by that, I don't mean something mystical. I mean this domain of time and space and matter and duality. Has opposites. For everything, there is an opposite. Male, female, night, day, big, large. The fundamental duality in the earth school is love and fear. The opposite of love is not hate, it's fear. And so when you have an intention, most people think an intention is what they're going to do. It's a goal. Like I'm going to have children. I'm going to become a welder. Or I'm going to be a billionaire before I'm 38 or 28, or these are out tensions, you might say. Out tensions. Out tensions, not hmm. intentions. The hmm. int in other words, your intention is to hold, to speak with the energy of love, with love. And the opposite of that is fear. Let me explain that so you just can see what I'm talking about more clearly, maybe. Well, so that you can. Fear comes to us as uh, experiences such as resentment, anger, jealousy, competitiveness, overwhelm, superiority and entitlement, or inferiority and needing to please. Every Compulsion like workaholism or perfectionism is an expression of fear. So is every obsession. And so is every addictive experience. Whether your addiction is to alcohol, food, sex, pornography, shopping, gambling, whatever it is, that is an expression of fear. So, you can look at your personality this way. It's not a single thing. It's got a lot of aspects. Mm -hmm. Each of those aspects are a part. So I've described some of those parts, the parts that originate in fear. So let's put all those in one category, a basket, put them in a basket and put the label on the basket, right? Fear. And the one thing about that, the two things that, Everything in the fear basket have in common is they hurt when you experience them. And number two, when you act on them, they create painful consequences. They create painful karma. Now, you also have other aspects of your personality, parts of your personality, and you experience and they come from love. They originate in love. And you experience them as gratitude appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, all of the universe. 
So let's put all of those experiences in another basket and we'll label it love. The karma that you create for yourself, which means the experiences that will come back to you as you act and speak, depend upon the intention with which you are acting or speaking. <coughs> if it's love, what comes back to you are the consequences of acting in love because it's love that infuses your deed or your word and it's love that affects the person you're interacting with. And what they experience is what comes back to you. And that's also your karma. In other words, karma can be wonderful. Mm. It can be, it can be yeah. opening, expanding, and it can be painful. And you say, why did that happen to me? It happened to you because you intended it. But if you don't know your intention, if you're not aware of it, you will ask yourself, how could this happen to me? Because if you're not aware of the intention that you're holding when you speak or act, it's unconscious. And every unconscious intention is an intention of fear. That's why it's a good idea to become aware of the intention that you're holding when you speak or you act. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Oh my goodness, yes. Now, I, you and, mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. You and, you and Linda, um, you, you, you've, you've done so much work with your wife, Linda Francis, who, um, your, who was your spiritual partner. And, and likely, would you say now, she's still your spiritual partner, Gary, even though she's returned home to her non-physical? Uh, yeah. Yes, yes, I would. And uh, we never referred to ourselves as married, although we were. Um, but we didn't do it for the reasons most people got married. Uh, I simply wanted, uh, anyway, uh, Linda to be better taken care of if I should uh, have passed on first. Yeah. But uh, so we are spiritual partners. We've always looked at ourselves as spiritual partners. For the 27 years that we were together in the Earth School, now her incarnation is gone. It's ashes and dust. And it's not coming back. And I loved everything about it. I loved the way she looked and laughed and smiled and dressed and and uh, laughed and uh, the way she related to people. Everybody loved that about Linda. But Linda is still here. Yes. Still present. And that's what I'm co-creating with now. And I'm telling you these things so that if you don't resonate, if you resonate with them or you'd have tuned out by now and turned off by now. But since you resonate with them, to validate I, validating as a voice coming to you from outside your head. When a personality dies, it is because its soul chooses to return home to non-physical reality. Not the personality. The personality may not want that at all. The soul is the one that chooses in its wisdom, which is beyond what we can grasp. Yeah. Linda's soul chose to return home to non-physical reality. And that caused a lot to happen in me. And I've written about it, by the way, uh, as it was happening. I wrote 11 personal messages and I ask our support team to post them on our website, which is theseatofthesoul.com. The same name as the book that we're talking about. Yeah. So when you go to theseatofthesoul.com, you go to the menu, click Celebration of Linda Francis, or it'll be something like that. And that will take you to a page that's a video we made for Linda, our support team, a month, two months after her soul returned home. And also... It'll take you to those personal messages of what I was experiencing at that time because I wanted to share it in real time and not wait until later like now. Are you ready to take your relational skills to the next level? Join us April 12th to the 14th, 2024 for In Bloom.
a love and relationship summit. Real Love Ready is putting you in the room with 10 of your favorite relationship experts, including Dr. Gabor Mate, Jillian Turecki, and Dr. Jody Carrington. Learn from the most trusted names in love with a weekend of skill building, growth, and community. Be there in person in Vancouver, BC, or join us virtually from anywhere in the world. Head to realloveready.com to learn more and secure your spot. You can use the code LOVE15 to save 15% off your tickets. I truly hope to see you there. Create real power by becoming aware of the parts of your personality that do not create in love, that do not create with the intentions of your soul. You become aware of them as fully as you can. You never suppress or deny or repress an emotion. On the contrary, you experience it as much as you can somatically in terms of your body. That's called emotional awareness. And you look at the thoughts that it's thinking and you search inside yourself, not in the world for the causes, but inside yourself for the physical sensations you're experiencing in your energy processing centers like your throat, your chest, your solar plexus. In the East, those are called chakras. But here in the West, we don't speak Sanskrit. They're energy processing centers. And when you find painful physical sensations in any of those centers, you know that fear is present in you. And if you know that fear is present in you, because you're hurting already and you know it, put your attention inside yourself and find out where and in what way. What is the sensation? Is it throbbing, aching, churning, burning, stabbing, stinging? What is going on in your energy processing centers? And when you're in fear, it'll be pain painful physical sensations. And then while you are experiencing those, and while you're experiencing the thoughts of those frightened parts, but not my frightened parts of your personality. Oh, and by the way, when you look at the thoughts that that part is thinking, they'll always be judgmental and comparative. Like, oh, I can't do that. I'm not that good. Or she's so stupid. I'm so stupid. These are the kind of things that frighten parts of your personality think. While you're experiencing all of that, then use your will, use your will, Robin, your volition, to move your attention to a loving part of your personality, one that's grateful or appreciative, a time when you knew you were loved or you knew you were loving. And do this to the best you, in the best way you can. Reach for what you can access. That's creating authentic power. That's the moment. That's where the rubber meets the road. And the more you do this, the more that frightened part of your personality begins to lose its control over you. And as you create authentic power, you move beyond the control of the frightened parts of your personality. This is what the state of the soul is about. It's what your life is about. It's what human life is now about. The seed of the soul will help you understand this. You probably, since you're multi-sensory, have a sense of it in your own terms, in your own way. The vocabulary of authentic power, which I use, to me is very precise and clear. And that's why I use it. But what's important is that you understand that you are responsible for what you create in your life because of the intentions that you choose, love or fear. Mm -hmm. And creating real power is creating the ability to know moment by moment what your intentions are, which means what you're feeling, what your emotions are at each moment. And at each moment, choose love. No matter what's happening inside of you, such as despair, despondency, depression, anxiety, rage, jealousy, competitiveness, overwhelm, or what's happening outside of you, like another 9-11 type event, and choose love. When you do that, 
you're creating real power. You're creating mastery in your life. It's an, you might call it a lifelong meditation, a heartfulness meditation. But as you use this meditation, it produces, it doesn't, you produce changes in your life because you become aware of when a frightened part of your personality is active. And we've already agreed that it's a good thing to know that because when you act on it, whatever that intention is, that creates your karma. And when right. it's low, if you're acting, if you're acting out of your frightening, if you're frightened part, you're going to create negative karma. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We use the term positive and negative because everybody knows it. But the universe doesn't really think in terms of positive or negative. It thinks in terms, it doesn't think. It, it expresses itself more in terms of cause and effect. Mm -hmm. For every cause, there's an effect. And every effect has a cause. And if you participate in the cause, you participate also in the effect. Right. That's your choice of intention is the cause, always the cause. And the effect is what it produces. And if the cause is love, if the intention is love, it produces the consequences of love and you encounter them. And if your intention for acting is fear, it produces the intentions of fear in yourself, not in other people, in yourself. And you experience them and they're painful. And when they come, if you don't apply any of the things that we're talking about and you say, how could he have done that to me? He betrayed me. He betrayed me. He told me he loved me and now he's with someone else. He told me he wanted to be my business partner and he embezzled from me. And when that happens, or even somebody says something you don't like and you react, react is what you do when you act again from fear. When you react, you create Again, more karma from fear, more pain. So, Gary, karma. what would what would be what would be? Let's let's say let's talk about this example of a woman, and let's say they're married, and she finds out that her husband was unfaithful. He, like she found out he's cheating on her. So, her her rather than reacting, you're what what if she's going to come from a place of love, awareness, and consciousness, and use authentic power in that situation. Her response, the most loving response, I mean, there's many ways that she could respond, but how would, out of love, what would be a way to approach that? Linda talked about this a lot because of something that happened to her in her life. She was going out with someone, seeing him a lot, and then she found out from one of her friends, she said, oh, did you know he's engaged? And she didn't know. Yes. Can you imagine what that did? Well, Linda yeah. will explain it. And the pain was intense. Intense. And she felt it. She decided to feel it. Yeah. And the next day, he arrived. Not invited, but happened to arrive. And when she saw him, she said, you don't have to say anything. I know what you're doing and I love you, but I'm not going to see you anymore. I don't trust you. So I don't want to see you anymore. And she said it with love. That is how accomplished Linda was. Her incarnation was, she is, she carries that energy. That mm. energy went straight into the learning, the evolution of her soul. I'm sharing this with you because it was a significant experience in Linda's life that she used as a teaching experience for others. And there were others that she shared too. But this one is very close to what you're describing. Yeah. Now, she was able to do that by using the tools that I've been discussing with you and the people who are listening to our podcast, emotional awareness, looking inside your body instead of outside the world for what's causing your pain. Because as you're multisensory, 
you begin to realize that things happen in the world, but they don't cause pain in you. They activate an internal dynamic in you. And it's that dynamic when it becomes activated that creates the emotional pain that you feel. And that is what you are challenging. That is the frightened part of your personality. And when you change that internal dynamic, you change permanently. That is yeah. authentic power, real power. That's what the seat of the soul is about. And there is no judgment in any of this. If you don't create authentic power, if you really let it rip and you tell this person who has betrayed you, what a frightened part of your personality is thinking. And it'll always be magnetically attractive to do that because every frightened part of a personality is right and righteous. You don't go to hell. The universe doesn't judge you. You just don't change. And you create more of the same, which is a real hell. Wow. And if you do, do what Linda did, create authentic power, you change. And if you do that, you don't get rewarded, you don't go to heaven. The universe doesn't say, nice job, six gold stars for that. You just change. It's all up to you. You decide. You are yes. responsible for what you create. You are responsible for the intentions you choose. And now that you are becoming multi-sensory, you can see this, these words from a larger view of the universe in yourself. And use what you are learning and use your expanded perception right now in the earth school with the person who has betrayed your trust. Yes. And as you begin to see that everything that you experience in the earth school serves your spiritual development, everything, your betrayal, the betrayal of someone else, of you and your trust. Uh, Linda's, Linda's returning home to non-physical reality. Everything serves your spiritual development, which means everything brings your awareness to either a loving part of your personality or a frightened part, which means brings you bliss or brings you pain. And when it's fear that's active, it brings you pain. And that is the universe's gracious way of showing you a part of your personality that you need to experience and move beyond the control of so that you can give the gifts that you were born to give. And that's where your joy and your fulfillment and meaning and purpose and vitality and creativity are. You can't do this while you're bitter about being portrayed or enraged. You can't do this while you're in fear. When you create with love, you are there. When you're experiencing gratitude, appreciation, caring, contentment, patience, awe of the universe, you are experiencing the energy of your soul. That is authentic power. When are you going to create it again? Beautiful. Before we go, Gary, I wanted to spend a little bit of time because this is a, a podcast all about love and relationships, right? And of course, we are interacting with people all day around in our lives. And, you know, you talk about these institutions that are crumbling. They're, they're becoming obsolete. And in the book, you talk about how marriage they is still are, marriage. And people are, people are still are getting... They are obsolete. They yeah, are yeah. obsolete. Yes. So marriage, what is the dif difference between marriage and spiritual partnership? Because marriage is one of those social structures. It's an yeah. ancient archetype that was designed for five sensory humans. It enables more efficiently the ability to survive. It's a natural division of labor. Yeah. 
a new archetype, spiritual partnership, partnership between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth is replacing spiritual, is replacing marriage. This doesn't mean that individuals in marriages are not becoming aware of what we're talking about. They're not becoming, they are becoming multi-sensory. And within their marriages, they begin to transform those marriages into spiritual partnerships. Yeah. But there are no longer marriages. A wife is, by definition, chattel, which means movable personal property of a husband. And a husband is someone who husbands things, who cares for it, takes care of it, manages it. Spiritual partners don't look at themselves in those terms. And they're not those things. Mm -hmm. Marriage partners do not consider themselves equal. And they're not. Spiritual partners are striving for exactly that. Yeah. Along with a new archetype of spiritual partnership, as part of that is the new archetype of the new female and the new archetype of the new male. The new female was satisfied, content, no, derived her meaning from bearing and raising children. And the old male derived his meaning from protecting and providing. The new female is not bound by any social conventions. She's entirely capable. She's entirely mm -hmm. She can do anything that her meaning calls her to do. She can fly a 747. She can run a corporation. She can be the, the president of a country. In addition to being a mother or a nanny, she can do anything she wants. She's not bound by convention. She is unlimited. That's the new female. The new male doesn't need a female to bring tenderness and intuition and sensitivity and care into his life. He has those things. He is those things. And you can see the new male everywhere. You can see him in airports with a <laughs> infant on his shoulder patting, burping an infant. You can see him pushing ah, baby strollers. You can see him driving on endless play dates and soccer to soccer games. He cares. He's not afraid or ashamed to cry with joy. He cares for life. He's compassionate. He's available. He's intuitive. He's wise. The new male and the new female together form spiritual partnerships. Oh, I love that, Gary. It's so, that's just so, I, like, when you, when you explain the new male and the new female and just the new multi-sensory human that we are, we are becoming, it, it is that, that I do, right, I do see that. I see just this rise and I, and I have been seeing it for decades as you're explaining. I just, and it's so, that is just, it brings so much warmth and love to my heart <laughs> to, to just even, right, to understand yeah. and see that. Because we are, we're expanding as, as multi-sensory human beings. I just think it's, thank God, thank God. <laughs> right? And we're another, creating these spiritual partnerships. That's another thing we can talk about is what is divinity? Mm -hmm. But everyone knows what you're meaning. I don't use the term God because in some cultures, including ours, mostly, it brings up, let me put it this way, it brings up the image in me of a male, old man, gray hair, beard, <laughs> short temper, got all the power. Don't mess with him. Because he can have, he can be, quote, merciful, not necessarily described as loving, but that's, but merciful. You can break his rules and he'll decide not to punish you if he chooses. That's not my understanding of divinity. It's not my experience right. of divinity. For me, I'm, I'm talking about divinity with a capital D. And I use the term God now because I know 
in my heart what I'm talking about, and it's not the old man. No, and it's not for me either. Yeah. Who commands, and you better be frightened of him because you're in big trouble if you're not. You can't be frightened of divinity. Divinity is love. Divinity nurtures. Divinity is nurturing. And you are that. Our new consciousness is taking us places we never dreamed. And we don't have to dream about them now. Because we are becoming them. Wow. Oh my gosh, Gary. I just, Gary Zukov, I love you. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. <laughs> I've loved you since I wrote this, read this book for the very first time when I was like 21. And, and um, I'm just so, this was a dream come true, being, spending this hour with you, a true dream come true. And would, would you like to close with anything that you want our listeners to know? Before I close with a blessing, is there anything I I would like that you would, would you, yes that you would like our listeners to to know or understand or be reminded of or maybe they can just go to your they definitely have to go to your website and read your book if they haven't read Seed of the Soul this is your invitation everyone <laughs> enjoy yourself enjoy yourself mm-hmm. and when you're not look at why you're not if you're not. It's because you are living in frightened parts of your personality and there's no joy there. There might be temporary happiness, like Linda found when she found somebody she wanted to have a relationship with. But then she found out that he was engaged to someone else and the happiness was shattered. That's the most that pursuing external power can do, temporary. Happiness. Happiness depends on what happens in the physical world. But when you create authentic power, you create joy in yourself. And joy is independent of what happens in the physical world. It's like a sun being ignited in you. And it's joy that's ignited in you. And you can practice this, you might say, by setting the intention to enjoy yourself. And if you're not enjoying yourself, you're not even aware of whether you're enjoying yourself or not, then you're unconscious and your intentions are coming from fear. But you can set the intention to enjoy yourself. And of course, it's not going to work the way you might think, like, I intend to enjoy myself. Oh, here it comes, here it comes. No, you set the intention to enjoy yourself. And the universe, (laughs) the teachers, will begin to show you what you yourself are choosing in your life. And acting on in your life that are not joyful and how to distinguish them from what is so that eventually joy becomes your life instead of pain. Love and trust becomes your life instead of fear and doubt. So it's not a commandment. Enjoy yourself. You're not doing well if you're not. It's just a thought. Enjoy myself. Because if I'm not, why am I not? Follow that all the way through. And as you do, you'll find that it's leading you toward joy. And that's what you were born to experience. You were born to give the gifts you were born to give. That's redundant, but you were born to give gifts. And it's only love, loving parts of your personality that permit that, that allow that, that enable that. And there is the joy. That is authentic power. And you were born to create it. And you will. Beautiful. Amazing. I'm going to um, close with with some blessings that I wrote with the words from your book, Seat of the Soul. May we ask the universe to bless us in our efforts to align ourselves with our souls. This asking will open a passageway between ourselves and our guides and our teachers. May we understand and know deeply that love is the energy of the soul. Love is what heals the personality. 
There is nothing that cannot be healed by love. There is nothing but love. And may we open to the consciousness of love, the consciousness of gratitude, appreciation, caring, patience, contentment, awe of the universe. And as Gary just said, unbridled joy, creating joy. Thank you, Gary Zukov, for, for sharing this time with us. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you for reading that, Robin. That's, that's beautiful. And that doesn't come from me. That comes from the universe. Everything that I share does. From the universe. Thank you. From, from the universe. The, yeah. the Thank you. you. A capital U. Like life. Capital with a U. Capital U. Thank you so much for listening. Visit realloveready.com to continue learning with us. Please rate and review this podcast. Your feedback helps us get you the tools and guidance you need to form more loving relationships and create positive change in your life. We at Real Love Ready acknowledge and express gratitude for the Coast Salish people, the stewards of the land on which we work and play, and encourage you to take a moment to acknowledge and express gratitude for those that have stewarded and continue to steward the land that you live on as well. Many blessings and much love.